This issue of isolation um, is kind of interesting because one of my experiences in visiting universities is that even though people um, have politically correct organizations like gay organizations and black and uh, many others, um, there's not a lot of interaction between the young people in those organizations. In fact, if you put them all in a room together, they go to war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering what you made of that. Um, well, I'm sort of dubious about what's come to be called identity politics mm -hmm. or the politics of recognition. I mean, you can see why this phrase came into existence because following the example of the black civil rights movement, everybody wanted to have their own movement, and, you know, why not? The trouble is that uh, it, as soon as you put things in terms of cultural identity, issues about class and money tend to get lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, you know, the, talking about the difference between the rich and the poor used to be what sort of held the left together in a you know, big, massive way. And you can't really get a left consisting of, you know, this culture plus that culture plus that culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, money, but also what gets lost, and do you think, is America gets lost in all that, yeah. in, in the way that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, the, the ideal of America is a classless society. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, someday we'll have an America which isn't sexist, which isn't racist, which isn't homophobic. The trouble is we won't unless there's a lot of change in the economics sure. set up. Right. And uh, this somehow never comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's as if... The idea of an alliance between blacks, gays, women, and just you know plain ordinary straight white male workers was you know never crossed anybody's mind. Right? Didn't work out very well. <laughs> well, I don't I don't know that it didn't actually. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, it seems to me that you know before the '60s, uh, movement for the end of racial discrimination and for uh, you know justice in the workplace you know, tended to go side by side. That is, the same people were identified with both. Uh, you know, the, the politicians on the left who were on the side of the unions were also on the side of racial justice. Uh, you know, there wasn't any big tension. It was true. It was hard to get the white unionized workers to go along with the struggle against racism. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the union leaders did their damnedest. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, the unions are somewhere off in a different place than the academy, and their issues aren't yeah. the academy's issues. Yeah. And uh, the situation of the American workers is going to get worse and worse, I take it, because of globalization. So it seems to me the academic left had better start worrying about, you know, what happens to the white working class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what, all, all that you're describing was in a sense, was pre-identity politics. Yeah, the, the, and then, b before the 60s, nobody yeah. heard of identity politics. Right. Exactly. You know, there were just two principal things wrong with the country, racial castes and economic classes, and you were supposed to be against both of them. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no great difference between the struggle against the one and the struggle against the mm -hmm. other. As soon as the word culture entered the picture, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't just people causing other people... Americans causing other Americans unnecessary suffering. It was, you know, this culture versus some big thing called the hegemonic white straight male culture. And right. I, I just can't, can't get excited about that issue somehow. Mm -hmm. And I'm never really clear what the issue is. Mm -hmm.